All right. Hi. How's everybody doing? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so today we're actually getting into the origins of vertebrates, the group of animals we're actually going to care about this whole semester, kind of their oldest records and kind of the context for the first evolution of this clade. And so uh, last week we kind of talked about big idea stuff, like our lectures were like the course intro and then kind of talking about fossils and time and rocks, bit of a crash course really last Thursday. Uh, but then I had you guys watch those lectures. I hope you did watch them uh, on YouTube about kind of the bigger picture. So it's really important to me to contextualize all this um, earth stuff, space stuff, animal stuff, evolution stuff, because I think a class like this is so powerful at giving you like a full comprehensive picture of biological evolution. Um, and I like to not start with like just giving you a fully formed little fish thing. I like to back up and go farther out. And so what we're gonna start with today is obviously this isn't a test. You can talk to your neighbors around you, but first, maybe try to do it by yourself. These are some of the things you heard about in those two lectures, especially this one is more focused on like the second one, which is like Earth history. And so these are all kind of events. There are things that happened and they have a relative order. You don't have to remember how old each one was, but which one happened first, which one happened second. Uh, on your own, give it a shot to put these eight things in order. And then in a minute, I'll ask you to talk to your neighbors and see what you, what you remember. So go ahead and do that, please. Okay, go ahead and talk to people around you. What choices did you make? Which ones are you confident about? Which ones are you like, I don't remember, I don't know. <laughs> Anybody feeling really comfortable? Like they're like, I got eight in a row that I'm like, I, I put some poker chips on my eight. <laughs> yes? I feel pretty comfortable. Who feels like they, who, everyone has the same first one, I assume, right? Well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the order I would put them in, although there is a bit of an asterisk on the left there. This is just the list. Don't worry about this. It's just the list. This is the order I would put those things in. 
Uh, anybody have something that differs from that or a question or a concern? Makes me, you gotta have an earth before you have a continent. You gotta have a continent before in a row to make a sedimentary rock. Things like that makes sense to me. I've got a question about number five. So number five. Occupation, um, which I remember from the lecture is, uh, is it was photosynthesis, right? But oxygen was being released into the atmosphere. Uh, was it the, like- So this, this is hardly something I would even call like an event. You guys might remember the great oxidation is bacteria photosynthesizing. And for the most part, this isn't talking about oxygenation of the atmosphere, oxidizing like all the iron out of the oceans. So for like billions of years, photosynthesis is happening, but like the chemistry of the atmosphere isn't becoming more oxygen rich until many other things are happening, but until all this iron is dropping out of the oceans. So imagine that early earth lava ball nightmare that has like no differentiation all the way to the, okay, there's water on the surface, but the water is still like a slurry. There's minerals and all kinds of stuff in there. And so getting the oceans to be like relatively clear of like humongous amounts of dissolved iron takes a really long time. So this is like a chemical oxidation. And again, this is like, I don't remember what it is. It's like one and a half billion years of a bar on the side of your screen, <laughs> hardly an event. This is the one I kind of wonder about, three and four. I think that's kind of active right now. So the oldest actual like rock you can go see on the surface of the earth right now and be confirmed as a sedimentary rock is right at the beginning of that second eon, right at the beginning of the Archean, 3.95 billion. Luca, we have great fossils in 3.5 billion of life, but I've told you in the lectures, like there's genetic estimates that go almost back to four, and there's chemical signatures in the rock that make sense if they're the product of like organisms that have metabolism, also in the early Archean. So these two are kind of, you know, I'm sure there is a right answer in the universe, but I don't know how right now we can say really strongly. I would probably keep with this, but this is the one I kind of was juggling. These ones I have no problem. You have to have mitochondria before you have things that are like plants, and then plants come mostly, or algae certainly comes before the things we recognize as animals. Any other questions about this stuff? Yeah, is there... Is the great oxidation to overlap with the first animal? So uh, the oxidation is referring to a really specific thing. It's that like iron falling out of the ocean. So that's like... So the, there's a whole pattern of like more oxygen and then more and then more and then more all through that. Are you that during the snowball earth, there was... Uh... Yes. That's right, but the oxygenation is, is oxid oxidation of the oceans way before that, and the uh, slowly increasing oxygen in the atmosphere is always kind of happening up through what you're talking about. So it really bums me out that I, I mean, I am sad to have not have been here two weeks ago because I love giving these lectures in person. So you guys are watching them because then you can like raise your hand live and we can actually ask questions. Um, so I can't resist. I'm just going to do a little bit of a refresher because I think this is really cool to kind of place. We're not going to spend too much time. But this relative order of things, so here's billions of years, like as far as we can tell, this is like, you know, this is the age of our universe. You and I are sitting here in the present in this classroom. And what's cool is like, this doesn't, we don't even know what this really is down here. Like no one's gonna be able to tell you very confidently exactly what this is. We just know it's outside of what we're ever gonna be able to know about, which is frustrating. And so here's some of the things I talked about in the relative order. We won't talk about them too much. Like I said, there's the slides online for you guys. I think it's cool that there's like this pattern here and the fact that we're like, as far as we understand the evolution of the universe, it's like still pretty new, almost 14 billion. But as far as we know, it's gonna go for like you know trillions. So it's still pretty early on that we're all sitting here. And so things like the formation of the sun, the formation of the earth are hitting here at about four and a half, 4.6 billion years ago. And so that's like fairly far back to as far back as we can possibly know, but it, you know, I like giving you guys just, like I said before, like a scaffold of understanding before we jump into the Earth system. Because once the Earth system forms, there is geological time, a geological column. I can throw Earth's geological column on this timeline now once the Earth forms. And so a thing I kind of want you to just sit with for a second, I'll stop talking, is like that blue up there is the Phanerozoic, the era of visible, sorry, the eon of visible life. It's where the fossil record really starts. It's where we're going to jump in today. And just like take in for a second how big the blue is versus how old we at this time know the universe to be. I think it's great. Okay. So here's these summary slides. You guys saw these. I won't talk about them too much right now, but these stars are meant to like correlate over to these events that you can see um, listed. So there's that Hadean one, the Archean. Archean is like right, right the second. Oh, I got to this is cutting us off. That's okay. So Archean is where we're getting that like definite first evidence of life, sedimentary rocks. 
oxygenation of the surface starts once all this oxygenation uh, is building up. But the great oxidation itself is going to be right up in here, crosses between the Archean and the uh, next one here, which is called the Proterozoic. I'm so sorry you can't see that. And so what I think is really cool is once we get to something like this in the Ediacara, where there's these soft-bodied organisms, we have a fossil record, there's animals showing up. Again, the reason I give you guys all this background is so like you understand and have a, a threshold for like, we're not talking about life just popping up in the oceans out of nowhere. There's tons and tons of like chemical, geological, and biological things happening to get us up to this time period. When people learn about the fossil record, it's usually like a 500 million year snapshot. And we're kind of just starting with like some kinds of life. And I think like really pondering what it would be like to step out of your time machine and walk around on this like barren rock planet with an ocean that's lapping against the shores. And you're like, you can live your whole life and it's never going to look any different. <laughs> and then I would get your time machine and go through two billion years later and you're like, it still looks like this. And so that's not true up here in the blue bar. In the blue bar, stuff's really dramatic and changing a lot. But for so much of Earth history, to your eyes, when you step out of your time machine, it's a lot of single cell stuff, a lot of bare Earth. Sometimes cool, crazy stuff happens. I still don't really know how to emotionally handle snowball Earth. They seem just terrible. Uh, but we're going to talk about times in Earth history when the Earth is like very warm, much warmer than it is today. We're going to talk about times when it's cooler than today. And these snowball Earths, because none of these events actually happen in the Phanerozoic, in this blue bar up here, we're not going to spend too much time about them, but we will come back to them when we talk about like ice ages as we have lived through them. Um, animals, meaning, I mean, we mean the animals have lived through them. But it's just cool that all these things that we need to talk about kind of have different levels of oldness. But okay, here's our timeline. We just did our phylogeny lab yesterday. And so I wanted to kind of show you guys this again, given what we talked about yesterday. So you can see on this tree of Archaeans and bacteria and eukarya, this tree of life, where we have a node that we can call LUCA. And that's actually like a point right here. This is like a clade called LUCA. Um, but this clay here, eukarya, you guys don't know what that is. Eukarya is a monophyletic clay. There's a common ancestor. All of its descendants, you and a plant and a mushroom and a bunch of other stuff, are all eukaryans. And one character of eukaryans, it's a synapomorphy, is that endosymbiotic event of mitochondria. The mitochondria inherited by that balsam root, by that magpie, and by that mushroom are from a single endosymbiotic event. Way back, we can be pretty confident in the Proterozoic, which is really cool. It's cool to me that this is not some big mystery. We have a lot of parameters we can put on these amazing events. So you've seen this already. Yesterday we talked about it in lab, but you've seen clades, you've seen nodes, you've seen synapomorphies. And so uh, this was a slide that I really was bummed out to not be able to talk to you guys about in person. I love showing students this. My favorite part of it might be that like, yes, we can have clades like Eukarya or Animalia that are monophyletic and they're interesting snake morphies that you guys should know because our whole class is gonna be about vertebrates. But just like for a quick second, just for a quick second, showing you like how crazy life can really be on this planet. How many of you was like the multiple evolutions of multicellularity news? Or did everybody already know that? Oh, maybe you already knew it. That's great. I thought, like, when I teach comparative anatomy, sometimes, like, I'm like, to a student, everyone's like, oh, what? Because, like, when you think of eukaryotes, you think of the, these ones. And so the whole idea that there's so many of these single-celled eukaryotes that used to be called protists are kind of spread phylogenetically all over the place. I think students usually react. I always react. If I'm actually the ocean, I actually think about it every single time I see any kelp where I'm like, that is not a plant. <laughs> is its own thing. And so if you guys ever see a kelp on a beach, like pick it up and look at it. The leaf is absolutely not a leaf. It's like a floppy rubbery thing. It functions like a leaf. It functions like it has roots, like hold it to the ground. It functions like it has a trunk. It's a completely different multicellular organism that also happens to photosynthesize. So the fact that brown algae and plants are like not multicellular in the same way is just so great to me. But anyway, all you need to care about are the clades that vertebrates are in, like Eukarya and Animalia, and the snake morphies that apply to vertebrates. So in this case, mitochondria here, and this particular evolution of a multicellular body plan. I'm not gonna go through all these again either. This is like a, definitely a bit of a crash course here, but when we talk about animal evolution more broadly, all the different types of animals that are on this planet, these are the extant forms. These are living organisms. We can make a tree like this out of their DNA, but of course we can use that tree to go look for fossils. That's really what we're gonna talk about today. And there's these clades I care you guys to know. If it's in all caps, it's a vertebrate relevant clade. A monophyletic clade called Animalia. Some people call it Metazoa, Eumetazoa. There's lots of details in here. 
But that's clade, monophyletic, vertebrates are animals, vertebrates are bilaterians, we have that symmetry. Vertebrates are deuterostomes, we haven't talked about deuterostomes yet. And so many of the features that make animals animals and make vertebrates a certain kind of animal are shared in a really, really, really ancient way. I don't know how what you think about it, but the whole idea of like some kind of central nervous system is not a vertebrate thing. There's a bunch of vertebrate specializations to our brain and our spinal cord, but that central nervous system structure, superstructure, those nerve cells are really similar to what's in an octopus or in a grasshopper or in a starfish. And I think that's really, really cool. And I think the history of science is such that people like study bugs or they study vertebrates. And I think it's always important to like keep that bigger perspective. But okay, let's get into some real paleontology stuff for today. We are going to be seeing in this class a lot of these things. These are time calibrated phylogenies. So up here on this diagram, you're seeing a bunch of phyla of animals. All the all caps ones are things that have to do with our phylum. Our phylum is called chordata. Vertebrates are in chordata. So the phylogeny is just like the phylogenies we've been seeing. This is the relationships between these different clades. The difference that you're gonna get with a time calibrated phylogeny is that there's these bars. These bars here, where there's a white bar, represents the fossil record of the taxon in question. So we have fossil annelids, segmented worms, that go back about this far. And then they still have a phylogeny for how they're related to other organisms. And so you can see these bars are different. So it's giving you information about the stratigraphic distribution of like what we really know for sure, and it's giving you the phylogeny. And so down here on the bottom is a timeline. Here's that Proterozoic Eon. We're going up into the next, which is the Phanerozoic. So we have these periods, Ediacaran, Cambrian. There's the dates there. And there's all these animals and what we literally know about them, their relationships and their fossil record. So these, as you might imagine, are extremely useful diagrams for paleo. You guys are gonna see time calibrated phylogenies basically every day for the whole rest of the semester from me. So talk to your neighbors. We're gonna spend a few minutes on this. Looking at this diagram of animal evolution, what observations can you make? What stands out to you? And what hypotheses are therefore testable given this kind of a diagram? All right, we're gonna spend a few minutes on this. So talk to your neighbors about that. Any of those marks Starfish, all the lobster, 
You're like, okay, I'm going to be spending somewhere around 630. It's going to be like, 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 it's How far back mollusks go? Yeah, interesting, right? So only three of these clades look like they break the boundary out of the like Phanerozoic eon, the Paleozoic era, into this older time, right? You can like draw that. Mollusks look like they do it. The Darians, so things like jellyfish and corals, and then periphera, which is sponges. We have three fossil record lineages at least going back that far. <laughs> That's a great observation. One of the things we're talking about. <laughs> Okay, we'll get the cards. <laughs> I heard you all talking. There's plenty of good stuff. Totally eavesdropping the whole time. So what what else? Well, animals are soft body uh -huh. and they're relatively close to mollusks. So maybe them showing up in the Cambrian is a result of uh, fossil bias rather than actually showing up that way. Reacting to that? What do we think about that idea? I mean, that's interesting, you know, to, to think about like the fossil record being determined by the shell, by yeah. the palace of that. Right? Yeah. And like, I never really thought about that. So something that's really interesting in this period of Earth history, especially, but it does continue all throughout Earth history. You guys, even 20 million years ago, we have almost, I don't think any fossils of annelids. They almost never fossilized. Almost never, because they don't have hard parts. There are some annelids that have like intense, scary mouths, and those can be found as fossils because they're sort of hard. But for the most part, annelids have no fossil record. Does that mean they didn't show up until one second ago? <laughs> Probably not, right? So that's something to really consider. You guys learned last week when we talked about fossils, what actually usually makes a fossil? Hard stuff, wood, bone, shell, teeth, so if you're an organism that doesn't have that, like you know, all these single cell organisms we've been talking about for the last couple of billion years, they don't make fossils usually because they're single cell, they just melt away. What other stuff? What about hypotheses? I mean, you guys are making observations, which are great, but how can we use this as a tool? What's an idea you could posit and then go test using this as like your baseline? Yeah, so sure. you can predict what fossils you haven't found yet, and perhaps where you want to look for Easily, the most fun thing I think you can do as a paleontologist is get yourself very much up to speed on some particular situation. It could be about something in the middle of dinosaur evolution and be like, how come we don't have any of that thing? Mm, it should exist. Okay, I'll go look in the right rocks on the right continent with the right age and see if I can find some. And so many times we do. So you might say, Okay, so here's this clay here that we're in called the Deuter Stones. Here's this other clay of animals that are bilaterians, just like us. If genetics is telling us that the bilaterian common ancestor is way back here, I should be able to find rocks that are this old. I should be able to find something on this lineage. I should be able to find something on this lineage. These mean we haven't yet for these different clays. And so who knows what this would look like? Would this just be some Deuter Stone that doesn't look like either one of these yet? Or maybe you'd find an echinoderm, or maybe you'd find a chordate here. You can use this as a way to test, right? You can uh, go out into the world and challenge this. Always, always, always help to update it, which is really cool. You guys saw 
in the lecture that was on YouTube from two Thursdays ago, the record from the Ediacaran is mostly these weirdo animals we don't understand. Remember, there's like the ones they look like kind of like bath rugs, like when you step out of the shower, that's what they look like. One of them called Kimberella, there's a couple others, but one of them is the thing that a lot of people are like, it is probably a mollusk. And that's why that thing goes back like here. But that mollusk doesn't have a hard shell yet. It's a rare instance of a soft body preservation and therefore we think mollusks have a likelihood that goes back this far. It's certainly based on the genetics, not surprising the mollusks go back this far. But maybe you have to evolve hard parts in order to like get known in the first place. Doesn't mean you weren't there, arthropods or vertebrates or starfish things. But if you don't have a hard part yet, maybe you don't, can't find your fossils. So that's really cool. That's exactly the kind of stuff we should be thinking about when we get into the uh, early evolution of animals. At the beginning of animal evolution, everybody's pretty squishy. Everybody's pretty squishy. So here's a little zoomed in phylogeny of us deuterostomes. Did everybody kind of have this relationship in your mind? Like if you were if you were to get like pulled and it was like, who's a vertebrate's closest relative? A wasp or a coral or a starfish? Would you guys all have said starfish or sea star? Some people know that Some people, because it's a cool fact. This is a relationship. So there's this Deuterostomia clade. You can see there's all these crazy invertebrates that we're not going to talk about. We're going to go over here towards ourselves. But Deuterostomia is a clade that's been known for a super, super long time. Like the 1800s, people figured out that these animals and these animals were these things called Deuterostomes, which is really cool. And they did that with developmental biology. So there's two characters that I want you guys to have for Deuterostomes, two uh, synapomorphies of Deuterostomia. And one of them is this condition called deuterostomy. Surprise, I'll tell you what that is. And then the other one is these pharyngeal gill slits. In a larval stage, almost every single one of these organisms has right here like a gill structure for oxygenating their blood. So even a starfish as a baby has um, a kind of gill-like structure. Starfishes are super specialized, derived animals. They almost don't have it at all. But other things definitely do, like some of these worms. So let me show you what I'm talking about. We learned both of these from developmental biology, by the way, not from fossils. We can watch embryos of these things grow up and see how they grow up in exactly the same way in these really important details. And so here's what deuterostomy means. You guys probably know that when a gamete is formed, when a sperm and an egg meet and you have a fertilized egg, it starts to divide. There's patterns of cleavage for when those cells grow from two to four to eight to 16 to make the little embryo. There's different patterns of that cleavage, which is interesting. But then one of the first really important things that happen is called gastrulation. The little ball of cells folds in on itself. And that's when you're gonna have an inside and an outside of this little developing embryo. So we can watch that happen in living organisms today. Protostomes are a humongous clade of invertebrates. All the arthropods, almost all the worms, all the mollusks are protostomes. And what protostome means, proto is first, stone is mouth. And so that hole that forms in the little ball of cells during gastrulation becomes the mouth. The first hole that forms before it punches through is the mouth, so protostomes. And back in the 1800s, people looking through microscopes figured out that like, hey, sea urchins and people, we do this thing where actually the anus is the thing that forms first. It's still the same pattern. So you can see how they're related kind of to one another, but there's details that are different. And that first pole during gastrulation develops the anus. And for us, the mouth is the one that happens, happens at the other end. So second mouth. You and this flamingo and this starfish, all when your embryos have the same gastrulation pattern and a bunch of these details where the mouth is the second pole that forms. None of that is really important. It doesn't matter one way or the other once you're an organism, which one formed first. But that's a little sign of shared heritage, something about the developmental mechanism of these animals versus these animals that was a hint, even back in the 1800s, of relationships. And of course, now we've seen with DNA rock solid. That's deuterostomy. The other thing is these pharyngeal gill slits. So this is this very weird organism that's over there on the starfish side of things. Um, it's called an acorn worm. These things are still alive today. You can dig them up in the mud of the oceans. So they have all this interesting anatomy, but right here, they have this collar and these gill pores. They have a gill structure where there's these serialized structured um, passages where they can bring water in, pass water through. And in some cases, they actually do sift food and get oxygen with these gills in this worm-like organism. We have pharyngeal gill slits. You guys probably aren't surprised to think about like a fish having gills right here, right behind its jaws. That's what the basic vertebrate condition really is, having gills. But even in you, when you guys were developing in utero, 
This is what a really early human embryo looks like. So there's what's going to become the eye. Here's the brain. This is the embryo. And what's cool is in developmental biology of all vertebrates, you can stain the different tissues and see what happens to them. And so what this diagram is trying to show you guys is these little gill arches that form when you are an embryo, as you grow up, they're color-coded. Here's the nerves. Here's the muscle. Here's the skeletal features of your throat, some of the cartilaginous structures of like your voice box and your lower jaw. They're all linked. So parts of your throat and parts of your face, we can watch develop from like a gilly structure because of developmental biology, which is really cool. And we can see these same serialized gill arches, even in these animals that look nothing like us. That's super, super cool. Obviously, our gill arch structure is extremely derived and becomes really, really, really different. But developmental biology is like, again, one of these other lines of evidence for evolution. We can talk about DNA, we can talk about fossils, we can talk about anatomy, we can watch embryos develop and see a baby person, a baby elephant, a baby chicken all have that structure at the beginning and then turn it into something else. Super, super cool. There's a link right here. Uh, when you guys go on Moodle, look at the slide, you can click it. It's a YouTube video animation of human embryos like growing their gills and then becoming normal looking like us. It's very, very cool. Okay. So that's our deuterostome characters, the pharyngeal gill slits and the deuterostomy condition. Those are two kinds of ways we understand our relationships. Now we're gonna go back to our geological perspective here and jump in a little more. So here we are leaving finally this Proterozoic. We've had the Hadean, we've had the Archean, we've had the Proterozoic, that's 88% of Earth history. We're now finally gonna get into the 12% that's left and that's the whole rest of this class. The last 539 million years, this is that boundary. So that's our red alert. We're finally entering a new eon and a new era and a new period of Earth history. And so this period is called the Cambrian. You guys maybe have heard of the Cambrian before. You maybe heard of the Cambrian explosion. It's an explosion because all of the sudden, in rocks all over the world that are Cambrian in age, we can find fossils of organisms, of animals. And so the fossil record starts. I put explosion in quotes and I put start in quotes because we now know what we're really probably seeing is the evolution of hard parts in all kinds of different organisms. Arthropods with their chitin skeletons, mollusks with their carp calcium carbonate shells, vertebrate animals, very, very lightly in the Cambrian, but still there with their cartilaginous, maybe getting to be bony skeletons. So right here, all of a sudden, a lot of different organisms evolve hard parts. And even if they did exist back here, we suddenly find them in abundance in the Cambrian. So if you're a geologist in the 1800s, learning about the layers of Earth's rocks, no fossils, nothing, no. And then you hit the Cambrian, whoa, fossils. And every rock that's above the Cambrian is just chock full of fossils. So it looks like an explosion. Uh, so here's a nice painting. This was our title slide of the Cambrian. The Cambrian is a crazy place and a crazy time. Uh, do me a favor, talk to your neighbors, uh, make some observations. What looks weird here? What looks familiar here? The Cambrian is a time when we actually have really nice full ecosystems to study. So talk to your neighbors about the Cambrian for a second. There we go. All right, what are some things you guys are noticing? Anything familiar? Anything you're like, what's that? I want to know. It looks gross. Noticing that noticing what? Yes, John, go ahead. That there's, you know, the all of the all of the animals on this, you know, you know, uh, like picture have hard parts. A lot of yeah, well, there certainly are a lot of hard parts here. There's some fun like little squiggly algae here, some little wormy guys. 
So this is actually a, a painting of a very specific place. It's called the Burgess Shale, the fossil locality in the Canadian Rockies. You guys can go there if you want. Canadian park rangers, if you sign up ahead of time, will take you to this site. It's on the side of a mountain. And there's piles of rocks. You break the rocks open with a hammer and you're gonna find fossils of these organisms. They don't let you keep it usually because uh, it's the Cambrian and it's the Burgess Shale and the Burgess Shale is super important. But this is one really distinct locality and all these animals usually have hard parts. But one thing that's really cool about the Burgess Shale is that it's one of those Lagerstadt, you guys learn about, places with exceptional preservation. And the Burgess Shale is Cambrian and is a place where you can actually find soft tissue. So some of these animals like this one and this one are pretty squishy, or some of these animals are hard parts and soft parts. And in the Burgess Shale, even the soft parts are usually preserved. And so what's cool about these animals is for often, often we have many, many, many tens of specimens of each taxon. So you can like see them in different, they're all squished flat like pancakes. But you can see once you get 15 of them, you'd be like, okay, I think I get it, of how this animal looks and how it's shaped. So some, some hard, some soft, yeah, go ahead. Is um do we know like why at this time like hard parts started to form? That is an amazing question. What do you guys think? Talk to your neighbors. Why would hard parts suddenly evolve? What the heck? It's been soft for a long time. Talk to your neighbors. That's an outstanding, current, all the time Cambrian research question. Talk to you guys. Talk to your neighbors for a second. Why would hard parts suddenly evolve? <laughs> <laughs> but I guess like yeah, before this time, like a hard time was considered a two, so it's like before this, you know, there was no hard time. How long did it be? All right, who's got a hypothesis, uh, an idea? You know, what could it be? What, what's the possible reason? We talked about like predators, you know, like is it a strategy to um, avoid getting killed? I guess? Yeah, uh, most animals who have shells, when the thing that eats them comes around, they go, <laughs> right? Shells and spikes. One thing that definitely also happens in the Cambrian, it's in the Ediacaran, but it increases into the Cambrian. There's these things that are nothing to do with biology exactly, but like oxygen is increasing in the atmosphere and in the ocean. There's even more oxygen. So body size we're seeing increasing in most clades. So animals and other organisms are getting larger. If you're getting larger, maybe you're being able to eat each other more. You need hard parts, maybe. Evolution doesn't work by what you need. But if you evolve some way to consume, or if you evolve some way to not be consumed, that's a very, very, very ancient classic way we can expect to see selection driving things like the evolution of hard parts. What's cool is a lot of these phyla evolve hard parts, but they do it in insanely different ways. Mollusks and arthropods and vertebrates, we should talk about those, they have totally chemically different hard parts that they build in completely different parts of their bodies. So the theme is like, I've got a thing to protect myself. I've got spikes or a shell or something, but they're independently evolved. So it's the same ecological pressure probably, but then animals are fighting different ways to do it. A calcium carbonate shell, a chitin exoskeleton, hard bony plates. It's very cool that at the same time it's all happening, but in totally different ways, original ways. Interesting. Good ideas. Anybody else have any other ideas? I mean, there's a lot of them, by the way. This is like a whole field of research. Yeah. Is it similar to like, you know, oxygenation and that like mineral availability or you have to have a certain level of uh minerals dissolved in the water if you're a little baby snail if you're going to take that out of the water and build your shell with it so you're going to have these chemical thresholds that have to be true before hard parts can even evolve and so maybe a chemical situation in the ocean got to a certain level and all of a sudden mollusks and maybe that's something that happened for them earlier and then they can do that i actually think that's me making it up i don't know that that's the case but that's like a really great idea that's inherently a testable idea that's awesome so okay, well, it's a fun. Yeah, go ahead. In order to be a big animal, you need to have muscles to move, and you need attachment points, which require a skeleton. How about that? The bigger you are, the harder it is to move around. You're not a single cell anymore, so you need muscles. You need a hard part. You need to anchor your muscles on something. Maybe you build a shell around your body. Maybe you have an internal structure. So that's interesting. Maybe locomotion is a co-driver, or maybe a primary driver. Body size evolution of skeletonization. These are great, right? These are all really interesting ideas that are all, I think, inherently testable. I'm sure if there was a Cambrian scientist here, they'd be like, it's this one, and they'd tell us all why. I don't know why. But you guys, those, those were really excellent hypotheses.
So one thing that's uh, really changed in the last, like, I'm going to say 20 years or so, is our resolution within the Cambrian has gotten really good. Uh, when the Burgess Shale became really, really, really well studied, it was first found in the 1920s, but really, really well popularized in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we kind of had this understanding of that explosion of animal life. We now have, because of rocks in China and other places, a much better understanding of like what happens during the Cambrian. And what you guys can see is we go from that Ediacaran fauna, where it's like a lot of stuff that's like on the surface of the ocean floor, like the top of the mud. When you find the fossilized mudstones from the Ediacaran, there's not burrows and it's not all disturbed. In the oceans now, and we see throughout the Cambrian the evolution of this, the sediments disturbed, the trace fossils start to grow. There's tons of different kinds of animals and all kinds of different things. So it's really cool that the Cambrian, which is not a short period of time, it's too many tens of millions of years, not just like a time when there's all these crazy looking things, uh, is a time when we're seeing increased trophic evolution, ecological evolution in the ocean realm. It's super cool. Like the age of animals is like for sure here in the Cambrian. I want to show you guys some of my favorite Cambrian animals just for fun because I just think they're great. There's a bunch of animals in the Cambrian, and this is a really interesting idea to have when you think about evolutionary biology, that are really hard to tie to modern phyla. That thing does look like an arthropod. That thing does look like a mollusk. That thing looks like nothing and maybe isn't related to anything that's alive today in a meaningful way. That's cool. So something was happening, experimentation was happening, and some stuff didn't make it. This is one animal uh, called Opabinia. It's one of my favorites. There's a lot of fossils of Opabinia. It's got five eyeballs, which is weird for a bilaterian organism. Usually we're pretty symmetrical. But that middle eyeball almost certainly has to be some kind of like fusion of two, but it's still functionally five eyeballs. It also has this really long proboscis that's very squishy and flexible that it can grab stuff with. The tip of it is a little bit hard, a little bit reinforced. It's not a squishy grabber. So crab claw, crab claw mouth and five eyes. It also swims in the open water. There's Opabinia doing a backflip to catch that worm. That's like one of the cool animals. One thing that's always like shocking to me about the Cambrian is so many of these animals are so tiny. Like Opabinia is this big. It's not like a trout or something. It's like a little dude. I like Opabinia. I like Wawaxia. Wawaxia is one of these animals that people think is probably a mollusk. Uh, it has like the muscular foot that lots of mollusks have. That's Wawaxia right there. What would you do with this? What do you? How would you guys interpret this organism? Like, I, it's symmetrical, that's for sure. It's got all these spikes. It's got spines that always point up. That makes intuitive sense if you're trying not to get eaten. But it's still like, what a weird organism. We can't find any sensory organs on Wawaxia in any of the fossils. What's its deal? <laughs> and then this is the one that everyone usually likes. And this was, I think, Paul, you have this as like one of your favorite organisms is Hallucigenia. Hallucigenia is this animal. It's probably an onychoporin. That's a kind of animal that's still alive today called velvet worms. Hallucigenia has these really crazy claw feet, really weird tentacles under its head, and all these spikes along its back. When it was first found, wait, where's Hallucigenia? On the trial by... Uh, oh, yeah, this one. When this animal was first found, people put it the other way around. They thought it like walks on rigid spikes and then has like squiggly stuff up top. And then they found more and they're like, oh, probably it's got spikes up top. This animal's called hallucigenia because even back when they first found it, the scientists were like, am I hallucinating? Like, is this real? It's like a real animal. But there's a lot of fossils of hallucigenia. And now this whole animal is the namesake for a whole clade. There's many, many species of this kind of organism in the Cambrian all over the world. Gross. And so some of these animals look familiar. I heard you, some of you guys saying trilobites. Some of these things look like bugs. Some of these things look like worms. These things are absolutely sponges. So some of the animals look like what we already know, that it live all the way to the present. Some of them are oddballs that do not make it to the present. And so this is this uh, figure from the Royal Ontario Museum. This is a Canadian museum that houses a huge amount of the fossils from the Canadian Rockies from the Burgess Shale. So the Burgess Shale is a really specific place. This is how old the Burgess Shale is. It's a series of localities between 508 and 505 million years ago. So that's pretty far into the Cambrian. The Burgess Shale is a pretty advanced Cambrian ecosystem. And so here's a nice fossil of one of those swimming guys. This one's called Morella. It's a little trilobite dude. Uh, Morella is uh, this one. It's a little trilobite thing, but it swims up in the ocean waters. It doesn't crawl around on the bottom. So there's a really beautiful fossil of Morella to show you guys what they look like. And so we're not going to spend too much time on this, but I want you guys to look. Here's time. So this is from their exhibit. If you go to, if you go to Toronto, you can see this exhibit. 630 million, 542. That's the start of the Cambrian when they made the exhibit. 
in 488, there today. Here's all the phyla, just like you guys have already seen, of living animals. If the animal phylum has a box on it, it means it has fossils that go all the way back to the Cambrian. And then here's the phylogeny of these organisms. Here's what the Burgess Shale shows us. The Burgess Shale is a slice in time where you can go to rocks and peak and look at animal evolution. Talk to your neighbors about this slide for just a quick second. Make some observations about this slide. so maybe I all right, any, what are your observations? What are we talking about? Yeah, go ahead. So I, part of what we're talking about is just interpreting this, this um, sure. figure. So of course, please. I'm, yeah. So the first show, like white line, yep. um, is that thing is time. Yep. The date is then. Yep. Yep. So some of the fossils <laughs> date to earlier. But they were collected in the Burgess Shell. Some of them. Okay. Yep. So, 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 so the Burgess Shell preserve is a, is a really specific one spot on the Earth's surface and preserves soft stuff. But you can find shells and bits and pieces of other organisms before that. But you only find the hard parts usually and scrappy. Well, why don't they then think that the that snapshot of time is older? Just, if they're taking fossils from that period of time to older than five or five million years ago. Well, the rocks are what's dated for the Burgess Shell, right? The rocks are the rocks. The rocks have an age. And so we find fossils in that layer, and you might be in China or Australia and find fossils that are similar, and you know those are Does that make so sense? They're from different the fossils. Are different. Yes, yes. So this is like a phylogeny of like Earth's surface and all the different animal groups. And the Burgess Shell is one spot in Canada where you can like look into those ancient oceans. And you see a lot of these things, but maybe not all of them. What other observations people make? I heard a couple that were very intriguing. Some of the missing, well, some of the taxa that are around today but aren't found in the very shale, like nematodes, are really squishy and small. Yeah, so nematodes are really abundant today. There's nematodes in this room right now. <laughs> like, they're tiny in their soft body. So they, they have a garbage fossil record. So we know how, what they're related to. We know how they fit into this proterostome side of animals. But yeah, no fossils for everybody. Those are tiny organisms. I heard somebody say there's a lot of extinction. So one of the things that the Burgess Shale made biologists think about a lot is, imagine you didn't know anything about Earth's history. Imagine you weren't living the life you're living now. If you're an alien, you get out of your time machine in the Cambrian and you go snorkeling, are you gonna be able to look at all these organisms and pick out, hey, you know what? I bet if I come back in 500 million years, that organism's descendants are gonna be a really huge successful clade. That organism is probably gonna be extinct really soon. How could you possibly know? And the whole point is you can't. And so what's really interesting is how many of these oddball clays, oddball anatomies, if they hadn't have gone extinct, would still be around today in some way? We don't always know. We almost never know particularly why clays go extinct. And so what if the mollusk one had gone extinct and our world never had squids or clams or snails or slugs? What if the vertebrate one had gone extinct and we had a world that was full of arthropods and plants and mollusks and maybe some Cambrian weirdos that are still around and there was never a fish or a reptile or a bird or a mammal or anything. There's an extinction event back here about just one or two little lineages. You can think about it as like losing that 500 million years. That's also true for like all the other times in Earth history. Could you guys look out the window right now at all the things on Earth's surface and be like, I bet if I come back in another 500 million years, this organism's descendants are gonna be everywhere. And this organism's descendants are gonna be nothing. They'll be extinct. 
trippy. It's a bit of a woe dude thing, but I really think it's a fun thing to think about. And the Burgess Show really inspired people to think about the fossil record like that. And to drive that point home to you, here's another really pretty image of the Cambrian. Some friends you've already met, the big predator we didn't talk about. There's Morella, you saw swimming. There's the hallucinogenia, some worms, some sponges. We are in the Cambrian. There are chordates, our phylum, in the Cambrian, but they are super tiny and not very common. So if you did your snorkeling in the Cambrian, you would not be like, oh, wow, look at that little wormy dude. This is our relative in the Cambrian. I bet you if I come back in 500 million years, there's going to be things called blue whales and dinosaurs and elephants, and they're all going to come from something like this. No, you're not going to say that. And that's what's super, super, super cool. There are chordates in the Cambrian. They are not common. They are not big. They're like just part of the fauna. So here's some pictures of some Cambrian chordates. They have great names. Metasporginus from Canada. Pikea is from the Burgess Shale. So there's a nice fossil. It has these like sensory antenna up front. It's got a tail fin, got some interesting muscle stuff happening. I like this name very much, Haiku Ichthys. So the Haiku fish is from China. Really, really cool. And there's the fossils of these guys. There's the gill basket, those gill arches on Metasporgyna with these weird eyeballs sticking out way up in the front. These are what chordates look like in the Cambrian. And there's even more than just chordates. There are true vertebrates in the Cambrian. Both Metasporgyna and Hycoichthys are technically in our real clade vertebrates. Pikea is not, Pikea is just a chordate. So what is a chordate? So chordata is one of these clades within Deuterostomia. There's this clade, and then there's these two giant phyla. Hemichordata, that's the acorn worms you already met with the gills. And then echinoderms, you might have heard about echinoderms. That's sea urchins, sea stars, crinoids, things like that. We're not gonna worry about them. The other side of Deuterostomia is chordata. And vertebrates are here, we're in there, but there's two other clades of animals we would call invertebrates, but they're still chordates. They're in our phylum with us. Cephalochordates and tunicates. And so we're gonna talk about them in a second, but first there are a number of features that actually unite all of these clades. And some of these have been known for a really, really, really long time. So I have three synaphan words for you guys for chordata, which is our phylum. If you're Linnaeus, that's our phylum. So here they are. This is one of those cephalochordates. Here's what it looks like on the outside. These are living organisms. You can go find them out in the wild if you really want to. People study them in the lab all the time. Here's what they look like on the inside. You can see they have that gill basket, which all deuterostomes have. Okay, what are the three chordate synapomorphies? The first one is a pretty great one, the notochord. This is a collagen cord that goes down your back. It is structural. You can look at those cords and they're like have these fibers that bind them and like this like cross weave so that these animals are flexing the little muscles they have. And just like Paul said, they're flexing against something hard. You flex your muscles against something rigid and you can make your body move. So this is a really important feature, a notochord that all chordates share. There's also a dorsal hollow nerve cord. So lying dorsally, lying above the notochord is a nerve cord. It is the same thing, it is homologous, it is your spinal cord that's going down the back of your backbone. So you still have something like a notochord, you absolutely still have a dorsal nerve cord. And then the other thing is a post-anal tail. The ancestral condition for chordates is to have a little tail fin. Caudal means tail, we'll learn about that in lab in a couple of weeks, but it's kind of fin terms. Here's that tail fin. So if you're creating movement by flexing your little muscles against that rigid notochord, that tail's giving you more surface area, you're swimming. It's starting to look a little bit fishy, kind of wormy and kind of fishy. That's this like chordate early state. Just to show you guys that notochord, here's a vertebrate just like you. This was a lamprey. We're going to learn about lamprey soon enough in this class. Lamprey have this nice cord right here that is still pretty collagenous, or sorry, cartilaginous, although they have um, little bits of bone on top like you have. So with this structure to support their body. You guys don't have a notochord anymore as like a full functional unit. You have bony vertebrae, but you still kind of have a notochord because developmentally, again, we can look up developmental biology for this, your intervertebral discs, there's a center part of it called the nucleus pulposus, which is developmentally the same thing as the notochord in these other chordates. So between your bony vertebrae, you've got little bits of your ancestral notochord. And you guys might slip a little bit of it and hurt yourself someday, or maybe you already have. And again, right on top of your nodal cord thing, you got bones, that's the thing we're gonna talk about later, is that spinal cord, very cool. 
Let's talk about these invertebrate chordates. So animals in our phylum that are not vertebrates, though they technically are invertebrates. So here's these little animals called sepalochordates. You maybe have heard them called lancelets. They live in like the sediment and mostly like, uh, well, certainly all these aquatic systems, mostly freshwater systems. They usually park their little butts in the sand and then they like filter feed. They pump water through their mouth and out their little gills and they filter that water out with these little tentacles. So they're filter feeders, chordates that park and filter feed. They're capable of jumping up out of the sand and doing a little swim and then going back into the sand, but they're filter feeders. They're taking in water, filtering nutrients out of the water system. This is according, like you, very bizarre ecology. The other clade that really is crazy, but again, people learned about these many, many, many decades ago through developmental biology and knew they were our relatives, are these animals called tunicates. You've maybe heard them called sea squirts before. Some of them swim in colonies out in the open ocean, like they're just always up there. Some of them are huge. Here's a dude swimming next to a really, really big colony of these things. They also, as adults, fuse their face to the bottom of the ocean onto a rock, and they pump water into their bodies and out of their bodies, and they filter the water to get their food. What's really cool, this is what tunicates look like. Maybe they're floating in this giant colony. Maybe they have their face fused to the ground and they're pumping water so they look like a coral or a sponge or something, even though they're recorded like you is that this is an adult tunicate. It has a lot of interesting internal anatomy, including this gill basket. This is what a baby tunicate looks like. It's almost like a tadpole. When they're born, they have their dorsal hollow nerve cord, they have their notochord, they have a tail fin, they swim around. And then as they start to grow up, they plant their face and they become a non-moving kind of filter feeding organism. Don't you hate it? Love it? <laughs> These are in our phylum. Like you're like, I like a wasp or an octopus. That animal does animal stuff. Well, guess what? Your relative is tunicates, which as adults do this all day. So think about that in the Cambrian. You see this little thing, these early chordates. I bet you're going to turn into people. I bet you're going to turn into <laughs> sea squirt. How would you possibly know these things, right? It's super fun to think about. So let's go back to our animal phylogeny. I'm gonna ask you guys a question again, using some of our phylogenetic terms we learned yesterday. So here's all these animals. They're definitely related in this structure. That's me circling the animals that are called invertebrates. My question to you guys, talk to your neighbors. How would you describe invertebrates phylogenetically? Go ahead and check. Oh, what kind of clade is invertebrates? Paraphyletic. Paraphyletic clade, right? We've got a common ancestor of all animals. And it's just like, you know, humans wrote the textbook because they just decided, you know what's really important? A backbone. And if you don't have a backbone, <laughs> You might as well be a sponge, it doesn't matter. Anyway, just think about that. We decided all the names for these things. We decided we drew all the little lines on top of all this biodiversity. So whenever I hear the word invertebrates, so dumb. I just hate it so much because there's so, by the way, almost all the species on earth that are animals are here, right? They're insects. So it's like, pull your jets, invertebrates. Okay, now we are finally in the Phanerozoic. Now we're in some like hardcore class content that you guys are gonna have to get some mastery over over the next couple of weeks. This is the geological time scale. One really big eon called the Phanerozoic, three eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, the Cenozoic, and a bunch of periods. Some of these periods, I know you know, like Jurassic, you've heard of before. Other periods you maybe do not know. Here they are, this is their time scale. We are going to be learning all about these. So this slide, is gonna be a bedrock for you. And by the time we're like halfway through this class, I'm sure you'll be very comfortable with these. Here's the ones that you're gonna be like responsible for, the periods themselves. So the Cambrian, the Ordovician, the Silurian, the Devonian, the Carboniferous, and the Permian. There's six periods in the Paleozoic era. These are their dates. These dates are always being refined, but that refining is usually reducing of error bars at this point, very little squiggle anymore. Cambrian starts at 539 million years ago. So 539 to now, that is the Phanerozoic. That is when we have, quote unquote, a good fossil record. So you can see the Paleozoic takes up like almost half the time to the present. 
this dividing line here is about a little over 250 million years ago. So that's like most, like half at least, right, of the whole Phanerozoic is this era called the Paleozoic. So we're going to talk about that a lot. Then we got the Mesozoic, that's when your dinosaurs show up. There's only three periods in the Mesozoic. That's not so hard. Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Cretaceous is easily the longest. And then finally, our last era, which is the Cenozoic era. That's us, mammals, being pretty dominant on the landscape. So the Paleogene period, the Neogene period, and the Quaternary period. One thing you might notice is that we're really good at cutting up time the closer we get to ourselves. We know more, we can be more specific. There's gigantically long periods in the Paleozoic. There's pretty tight periods up in the Cenozoic. One of the things that some student always notices when they look at this for long enough is they're like, wait a minute, like the Devonian or the Cretaceous as a period is like almost longer than the entire Cenozoic. It's like, yes, it's because we made the rules and we decided <laughs> what to call everything. But this is the nomenclature that I care you guys to kind of put some studying into, to get a good handle on, at least the relative order and hopefully some of the dates. I'm gonna ask you also questions about older units of time. So the three other eons, the Phanerozoic's the last one, you already learned about the Hadean, the Archean, the Proterozoic. And then within the Proterozoic, there's just a little bit we spent detailed time on. So that Snowball Earth cryogenian period and that Ediacaran when we get animal fossils really for the first time. These are the things I care you guys to try to get your brains around, because we're gonna use these words pretty comfortably in this class. Okay, this will be on Moodle, of course. Here's the not friendly version. If you're a geologist, here is the September 2023, most recent internationally approved golden spike in the ground somewhere standard for Earth's history. So this is one of humanity's like greatest achievements. It's up there with a bunch of other things just like it, where we've been able to divide up the history of the Earth and agree internationally across continents, across countries, what the ages of the rocks are, how they're related to one another. So I'm asking you guys to know Phanerozoic and Paleozoic and Permian. I am not asking you to know Caesarelian and Artinskian, but just so you know, all these paleontologists out there in the world get really specific when we talk about time. You guys don't have to worry about these ones. <laughs> just to really show you how intense it can be. Okay, now let's get into our vertebrate evolution, our vertebrate uh, situation happening. So here is our modern vertebrate phylogeny, vertebrata, a monophyletic clade of animals that absolutely have backbones. There are three characters that unite all living vertebrates and all fossil vertebrates. I'm guessing some of these won't be a surprise. Vertebrae, a vertebral column. So what these are are bony structures around that ancestral notochord. So that notochord is this blue cartilaginous thing here that all chordates share. Vertebrates start to add bony structures above and below. We're gonna talk about these a lot more in lab. To make, this is an embryo, this is an adult star, to make these structures called vertebrae with a spool looking centrum in the middle and structures above and below. So these bony features around that notochord, that's a vertebrate feature, the vertebral column, a backbone. Shouldn't be too surprising, I guess, as a vertebrate snaphomorphy. Two other vertebrate snaphomorphies I care you guys to know. This is when skulls evolve. So a bony skull, really what that means is a housing for the brain. Skulls get elaborated on, selection acts on skulls constantly because it's how we eat and sense the world. It's a very important part of your anatomy. The original skull is really a cartilaginous and then bony encasement of the brain. It's protecting the brain, which is up front where all the sensory organs are, and a lot of the nerve system is like being led from, is up in the front of those nerve ganglia and what we're gonna eventually call the brain. So here's a lamprey that has a really interesting cartilaginous skull. Here's a nice uh, shark neurocranium, chondrocranium, because it's made out of uh, cartilage. You'll see some of these in lab, there's the big eyeballs. And so right in here, the skull is an important vertebrate feature. So these are pretty, Straightforward, right? Backbone, skull. And then the other one is how the brain is developing. All vertebrates share what we call a tripartite brain, a three-part brain. This is a pretty uh, shabby illustration of an early lamprey, like a developmental baby lamprey. And there's three swellings in the brain. And those three swellings are all sensory uh, innervations, places where sensory structures can give signal and then the brain can interpret them. And so in that brain, those three parts of the brain, they're olfactory, which is chemosensory, so taste and smell. Optic, that's your eyes, visual information. And otic, which is the ear. So there's a lot of things that happen to the brain that we're gonna learn about all throughout vertebrate evolution and many different vertebrate clades. But the ancestral vertebrate brain has these three swellings tripartite brain surrounded by a cartilaginous or bony skull, and then that notochord cartilaginous surrounded by 
bony vertebrae or some bonies like a structure vertebrae. Those are our vertebrate uh, phylogeny, sorry, uh, vertebrate synapomorphies on our phylogeny. Those are the ones I care you guys to know about. And so you can see vertebrates are pretty fishy. If we look at like the early splits, this magpie up here is representing all you guys to live up on land. But here's our early splits with invertebrates. And the first split that happens, there's two clades. On one side, we have these animals called cyclostomes. So just like you learned deuterostome and protostome, stone is mouth. So deuterostome is first mouth, or sorry, protostome is first mouth, deuterostome is second mouth. Cyclostome is a circular mouth. Nathostome, don't worry, we'll come back to this word, is a jawed mouth. You have jaws. These are jawed fishes or jawed vertebrates. These are jawless vertebrates. So cyclostomes are a monophyletic clade today with two representatives. Maybe you've heard of some of these. We're going to have some fun and show them to you because it's important to like get a handle on the modern biodiversity before we get too crazy with all the fossils. Uh, this is a hagfish. Anybody know hagfish? Some big naughty in the audience. These are spectacular animals. They're so gross. I remember being a child and I had a book and it had a hagfish and I would skip the picture because I just did not like hagfish. This is what a hagfish mouth looks like. Those are not teeth uh, in the same sense as your teeth. They're not made of a bony structure with enamel. They're almost like a keratinous structure. There's some phosphorus in there. They're very, very, very weird. So they kind of move, but they're not jaws. They don't like close. That's a hagfish. Hagfish also have this amazing ability. They tie themselves into knots. They don't have a lot of ability to get a grip on things besides their mouth. So when they're foraging, and I'll tell you about their foraging in a second, they actually tie their bodies into a knot to like get tension and like rip meat. They are predators or scavengers, mostly scavengers, off of the things that they're eating. So they can tie themselves into a knot. That's how flexible they are and cartilaginous they are in their skeletons. Here's what hagfish are very famous for. If you guys look them up on YouTube, you can watch some really fun videos. They go to things like whale falls. They live in like the really deep ocean. So here's the deep ocean. Here's one of their vertebrate relatives, a whale that died and then sank into the black. And now that whale's mostly been eaten. And there's all these whale bones. And hagfish are among those animals that are like pulling every little last bit of meat and fat off that dead whale or dead, dead, animal or dead shark or whatever. They are big time deep ocean scavengers. Super fun. That's what they do today. The other thing they do is produce like a slime. Let me see hagfish slime before. Their defense mechanism is like if you get anywhere near them, you can watch again, great videos. It wouldn't. It's not the right class, so I can't show you, I can't get distracted. But if you watch like a fish go up to like, or a shark go up to like eat a hagfish, all of a sudden it's like, and it can't close its mouth, and its mouth's full, it's like ball of slimy gel. So that's how they protect themselves. This is a fisherman in Japan dealing with hagfish in a crate, and there's his arms, he's trying to pull the slime out. Super great, super weird, super gross. Here's their mouth though. Uh, they've got a gill opening way back here. All down their body are these glands though that release that slime. So these things are kind of wormy, right? But they really are vertebrates. There is one or two, really, hagfish fossils, and that's it. This is the most important one. It's from the Cretaceous of Lebanon, so 95 million years ago. Hagfish are super, super, super soft. Their bones do not get hard like yours do. They don't become true bone. They remain in a cartilaginous state. So hagfish fossils are super, super, super rare. But we can infer their presence. And like I said, in a couple rare spaces on Earth, we can find fossils of hagfish. This is the other clade of jawless vertebrates that's alive today. These are called lampreys. That's their order up there, Petromyzontiformes. We can just call them lampreys, don't worry. Anybody know lampreys? Lampreys live here in Idaho. Yes? Oh, a lot of nodding. Lampreys are great. There's that mouth, there's that eyeball, there's that gill arch, and those are the gill exits. Lamprey also have a bit of a nightmare mouth, if you've never seen it before. Again, not really true teeth, keratinous structures. Uh, not all lampreys, and so it's always funny to be like, not all, but not all lampreys are parasitic, but a lot of them are. They latch on with their sucker mouths like another kind of fish and drink the blood until they choose to stop. And so you get things like this poor salmon who's got a nice hole in its side from when this lamprey was latched onto it and sucking its blood for quite a long time. A lot of lampreys, especially the ones we have here in Idaho, are just like salmon and trout, or I'm sorry, mostly salmon, in that they're anadromous. They like go out to the oceans, they come back into fresh water, choose their adults to lay their eggs. And that whole time when they're adults anyway, or sorry, juveniles, they're parasitic on the salmon and other migrating fish. Whereas adults, they latch onto a rock, spawn, and die. What is so cool about a lot of lamprey, not all, but a lot of lamprey, is that their babies look like this. These are baby, baby lamprey that aren't parasites yet. They park their little butts in the sand 
And then they filter feed from the water. They bring it into their mouth, pass it over their gills, but they filter feed out food particles. So just like an adult tunicate, just like a lancet, so a chordate that's not a vertebrate, some lampreys, when they're babies, do this ancient chordate thing. Even though they can swim, they park their little butts and they filter feed. So that is really letting you know something about the early chordate and the early vertebrate condition. These are testable ideas. Is that the default? Is the ancient vertebrate a filter feeder? Really fun, really fun to think about. So that's lampreys. There are better lamprey fossils than there are hagfish fossils. Here's some really gorgeous ones, including this little baby, which is a larva from South Africa, which is really cool. And so we have a good idea of lamprey fossils. We see that by the Cretaceous, 200 and 100, sorry, 120 million years ago, we see a lot of like the reproductive behavior we see today with migration and little larval babies and adults, probably parasitic adults, which is really cool. So fossils can help us along with the living lampreys understand lamprey evolution. So that's hagfish and lampreys, and they have a pretty meager fossil record. It's really not too much. But here we go. This is how this class is going to look a lot of the time going forward. We have our time scale here on the left, 550. There's our line for the beginning of the Cambrian. And then, like we talked about earlier, a time calibrated phylogeny. So here is the known fossil record of jawed vertebrates, natho stones. You and I are natho stones. We go back this far. You can draw that over here. Nathostomes go back to the Ordovician. The lamprey fossil record goes back this far. The hagfish fossil record goes back that far. And then we have to use things like DNA to make our estimates for when they split from each other and when they split based on the fossil record and based on the DNA and other things, when they split from Nathostome. These are the three living clades in this ancient split. Cyclostome with two clades and Nathostomes on the side. That's vertebrate evolution scaled to the Paleozoic. You guys are looking at almost the entire Paleozoic here. There's some of the things we've met already, like Hycoichthys and Metaspergina. So true vertebrates that existed in the Cambrian. You can see that these are outside this monophyletic group called vertebrata. We would call these stem vertebrates. They are still vertebrates, but they're not inside this clade. They're outside of it. Stem vertebrates. This clade here, vertebrata, that's bounded by living groups, living lampreys and hagfish over here, living jawed vertebrates over here, is called a crown group. So the living members define it, that's all it is. The node that de is defined by this, this is crown vertebrata, this is crown cyclostomata. These two things are stem vertebrates. That's how we use those words going forward. There are lots of really cool fossils that we're gonna talk about in this class. Here's two lineages of stem cyclostomes, so early jawless vertebrates. They're on the cyclostome side of the vertebrate family tree. They're not on our side. They're with lampreys and hagfish. We'll meet them here in a second. And here's a whole bunch of really cool stem nathostomes. What I like is that nathostomes are defined by the presence of their jaws. So these are clades of fishes that we'll learn about today and then again on Thursday that do not have jaws yet. These are jawless fishes, but they're still on the nathostome side of things. They're stem nathostomes. This is a very weird time. One thing that is so cool about being able to map the fossil record with a phylogeny on a time scale, a time calibrated phylogeny, just like you guys saw in the Cambrian, is we can then use it to ask questions. So there's the Cambrian. That distribution of fossils, that phylogeny, here's the Permian period, lets you ask questions, lets you test ideas about what might be happening in the Cambrian, what you can go look for to answer questions in the Cambrian. And so, Talk to you for a second. How would you guys characterize this diagram of like the Cambrian? Fossil record is the gray boxes. Phylogeny is the black lines. Go ahead and talk to you for a quick second. How would you characterize the Cambrian? Fossil. Right. Yeah. That's kind of yeah, like when they were like branch child. I'm sure. Whether it is 
What are some uh, observations you guys are making about this? Somebody hasn't said anything yet. Somebody hasn't said anything yet. Oh, I'll bring the cards on Thursday. Don't worry. Come on. Is a like you see like a fossil record. Uh huh. Uh, but not much of one. Um, yet you know we have these branches that we've placed in time. But like, how do we know that that's when they branched off in time? Yeah. These lines are back here in the Cambrian, but like we don't have the fossils. Maybe yet, or maybe this is wrong. Maybe the phylogeny goes like this, and then really quickly radiates here. What's the only vertebrate fossil, crown vertebrate fossil, known from the Cambrian? These, this clade here, this this weird group here, we're going to talk about them in a minute. These these, these animals are called conodonts. They're the only ones that we literally have like rocks with a fossil in the rock, and it's definitely a crown vertebrate conodonts. A lot of other things are inferred to be present and maybe were present. We don't have their fossils yet. Maybe we never will. I don't know. Really interesting. Lots of questions can be asked in each of these periods. I'm not going to have you guys do this for every single solitary period. But obviously, the Ordovician is different from the Cambrian. Some of these clays are gone. <laughs> other things are evolving. Other lineages are doing other stuff. Obviously, once we get to the Ordovician, look at this. We've got fossil records of these ones, these ones, these ones, these ones, these ones showing up in the Ordovician. Cool. Silurian's the same, a little more stuff going on. Devonian's got a lot going on. Everybody's there in the Devonian. We're gonna talk a lot about the Devonian uh, in a couple of weeks, actually. So I just want you guys to think about this. Once we have these time calibrated phylogenies, we can use them as tools. Okay. There's three characters for vertebrata. You saw them on that tree of living vertebrates with the shark and the magpie and the lamprey and the hagfish. Here's those same things, vertebra, skull, tripartite brain, but mapped on the fossil phylogeny. So for the most part, I'm going to be giving you these phylogenies as fossils. Remember that all we have today is this group and this group. But we can infer, even if the fossils are scrappy, we can infer the presence of a tripartite brain, vertebrae, and um, a skull in all of these things. Of course, their fossils show us that. But that's what's really cool about taking the modern and the fossil and comparing them. All right. As we go forward in this class, we're going to be able to give features to some of these groups so you guys can learn about them. We're going to learn two features for this clade called Anaspida and one for this clade called Conodonta. Anaspida is one of these first jawless fish clades, and Conodonts live for a super, super, super long time. They're really important in Earth history. We're going to stop, though, for today because I don't want to overwhelm you guys and all of a sudden jump into this pile of fish. Don't worry, Thursday will be a big fish pile. So thank you. Thank you.